Top of the morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well. I'm really looking forward to this session with Dr. Brody. Let's see. There he is. We're going to everybody. Here he comes. Connecting. Mark, top of the morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Good, good. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate you taking some time. My, my pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for having me. You're doing a, a great service to golfers all across the world with, uh, with all the, uh, the content that you provide, uh, this included. Oh, thanks so much, Mark. I, I, I really, I must say, I've, I've learned as much as hopefully everybody else is learning, and I, I, I'm thoroughly enjoying the common threads that I'm seeing. All these great minds in golf, how they weave a similar thread through the game, and it's, it's a great way of thinking, I think, whether you're a golfer or a coach, and I just thought, hey, who would be better to add to that framework than, than yourself, uh, the founder of Strokes Gain. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Can you tell us, uh, I'd love to find out how you got involved with the PGA Tour and statistics in general, golf statistics in particular? Sure, so uh, I'm a professor at Columbia Business School. That's my day job, but uh, I'm an amateur golfer and I've my, played all my life. And uh, uh, so I do basically applied math uh, analytics in, at the business school. And, and I had this idea, it was an opportunity to combine my professional and personal passions, which would be apply some uh, analysis, analytics to golf data to understand the, the game a little bit better. And so I had that idea for, for quite some time. And I started looking around and I said, well, in order to answer some, some basic questions, I needed better data. What were the basic questions? If I could give you a magic driver and you could hit the ball 20 yards further, what would happen to your score? Or a better question I thought was, if you're shooting 90 and your goal is to drop 10 strokes to be, to sh be shooting 80, where, where are those 10 strokes gonna come from? And I would play uh, around. I never, and at the time, played with any PGA Tour players, but I'd play with my club pro, and he was quite a bit better. And I'd try and figure out, yeah, okay, he's better than me at every single shot. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one particular shot I can hit better, but every type of shot, he's, he's yeah. better than me. But, but where, where does the difference in my score and his score come from? And I think if you want to get better, it's important to know where, where those differences lie so you know where to focus your attention and, and your practice. And so I developed a program to start collecting amateur shot level data because there was no data that I could find. And at the time, uh, the, the PGA Tour was just starting to collect their shot link data. Okay. Uh, so I actually started developing the, the program to collect amateur data before the PGA Tour started its shot link data collection program. But once they did, I said, oh great, there's this wonderful professional data that's out there that I could analyze. So I, you know, my connection with the PGA Tour was to call them up and I say, you have this great shot link data, I'm an academic, could I, could I do some analysis on this data? And they said, do you know how expensive it was for us to develop this system and to collect this data? You, 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 you just want us to give it to you? Uh, no, thank you. And, you know, they hung up. Yeah. Oh, that was, that was disappointing. Um, so I said, okay, I'll wait a year. And I called them up the next year. And I said, you know, you have this, this great data. I, can I analyze this data, whatever? And they said, uh, sorry, no, they hung up and, so I kept doing this. What roughly once a year, I you know I would call them up, and then uh, in 2008, I called them up and I said, you know, Mark Brody again, uh, you have this great data. And you go, you know what? Can you help us analyze this data? We have this great data, and we're not exactly sure what to do with it. Can you help us out? <laughs> That's I was like, great. <laughs> I've been waiting, been waiting years, years for this. And and what they 
they wanted help with was to rank putters on the PGA Tour. So they had gone through several iterations, starting with putts per round, mm. putts per green in regulation, uh, number of feet of hold putts. And they, they realized, as, as many uh, of you coaches and, and writers and, and, and pros and golfers realized that these were not good measures of putting performance. Mm. Yeah. And the, the list didn't make any sense. Uh, and it, it was it was just a, a puzzle. How can you do better to rank putting on the PGA Tour? And I said, well, you know, you, you gave me this data, and I can now, using strokes gained, rank approach shots and driving. They said, no, 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 no. Putting. We want to get putting. Because yeah. <laughs> that, that was what they thought was the biggest flaw uh, in their core core stats. Okay. Um, so it's, it all started with, with, uh, with that and them wanting to, to be able to rank putters better. That's so interesting. I've never heard that story, actually. I, I really love that. And so obviously you helped them with putting and then they said, okay, take a look at this other stuff and maybe you can help us there. And that's, that's really how Strokes Gain came to be. Yeah, so I had been doing Strokes Gain analysis since probably 2005 that I had it in my program and it didn't sort of get to the, to the PGA tour until uh, 2011 with, with putting. But when they rolled out putting, they had in mind that sometime in the future, mm. if this is, you know, takes off and if this is accepted by the golfing community, then we'll roll out other stuff. And it was a okay. few years later that they did uh, strokes gain tee to green and strokes gain putting. And then finally in 2016, they, they added the three categories, which are strokes gained off the tee, strokes gained approach, strokes gained around the green, and strokes gained putting. But the plan, even back in 2011, was to eventually add these. And five years later, they, they eventually added okay. uh, the, the other categories. When I do uh, some consulting work with, with players, I further break down strokes gain into many other, other categories. So instead of just saying approach shots, which is such a big category, mm. I'll look at 100 to 150 yards from the fairway, from the rough, 150 to 200 for putting. You know, I break down putting into short, medium, and long putts. You can look at any distance, distance range you want because you want to get into more of the details to say, okay, uh, your putting could improve, but is it more your short putts or your long putts or your medium and length putts? You know, what do you do next? And so that happens with somebody looking at, say, strokes gain from approach shots. If they want to get better in that, well, that's a big category. Is it their 125-yard shots that are the bigger problem or is it their 175-yard shots? Yeah. Um, and, and so you, you can do a much more refined analysis than just the four big categories, but you get a lot of information from those four big categories. Yeah, yeah. I remember it is amazing the detail that you get from that shot link data. I, I coach a, a player currently on the PGA Tour. Well, no one's currently on the PGA Tour, but he is a <laughs> card carrying member of the tour. And a couple of years ago, he had an interesting statistic from they rank, they rank the players uh, strokes gained from each foot. So seven footers, eight footers, nine footers, 10 footers, you can get all kinds of details. And he was number one in the world, well, on tour from nine feet, and he was like 118th from eight feet and 115th <laughs> from 10 feet. <laughs> I said, Mark, we've got it. You've just got to chip the nine feet from here on out. Yeah, yeah. So one of the problems with the, uh, the shot link stats that are on the, the PGA Tour website is I think it's too much information and too little content. And that's a perfect example that, that you bring up, which is it doesn't make sense to chop uh, putting into one foot increments. Yeah. And there is no way that somebody is truly, I mean, I, I understand what the, what the numbers yeah. say in terms of how many, how many putts you sink, uh, but it, it makes no sense that you could be number one from nine feet yeah. and number 100 from eight feet and number 120 from 10 feet. That's nonsense. Yeah. And what happens is when you break the distances into too small of an increment, now you get a lot of noise and you've yeah, lost yeah. the signal. The signal is 
how good are you from say seven to 12 feet? Yeah. That sort of matters. Correct. But how good are you from nine feet, one inch? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that, that all, all that points out is, well, we measured three putts and on those three putts, it's like saying, you know, uh, a baseball player, you'll, you'll, you'll see these when I, you know, used to go to Yankee stadium and you see, well, this particular player who's at bat, let's say, you know, a couple of years ago, Derek Jeter is batting uh, 652 in Thursday afternoon games when he's facing a left-handed pitcher. <laughs> and the wind's blowing out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, what does that tell you? Nothing. I mean, you're, yeah. you're just mining the data for uh, interesting facts that actually have no relevance to making you a better golfer. <laughs> true, true. It's almost similar to those facts that you get on the broadcast every now and then. I remember one year, Ricky Fowler, I think he won the Honda, and he had made 49 out of 50 putts for the week from inside 10 feet. <laughs> oh, ridiculous. Goes, oh, he's made 49 out of 50 10-footers, and that's really – he's most probably made 12 putts in that group that really mattered uh, from, let's yeah. say, from 5 to 10 feet. He's had 12, yeah. and he's made them all. He's putted well not quite 49 out of 50 well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's another perfect example where when you try and communicate something in a very simple way, you can often just distort and, and lose the, the, the real message. And there's, there's two problems with that. And you, you alluded to both of them. One is what gets lost is the inside of 10 feet. And people hear the 10 feet and think you made every 10 footer. Yeah. What happens when you make 49 out of 50 is you have all of these tap-ins inside two, two and a half feet inside the leather, and that's most of those putts. Yes. So to say that you made 14 out of 14, actually that's in one round, you probably have 14 tap-ins. So over the course of four rounds, you have a ton of those tap-ins. Yeah. So the 49 out of 50 is just sort of nonsense. What you really care about is how many have you made? Like you said, five to 10 feet is a range that, that really matters. Yes. So you subtract out all the ones that don't and you get to something that's more interesting and meaningful. Not Agreed. how many do you think inside of 10 feet? Agreed. I think to the, the, the other one, will, go ahead, Mark. The other one that I don't like is, uh, you know, Ricky Fowler is three out of five in sand saves this week. What, what does that tell you? <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't so. much. Doesn't, it tells you he's doing okay. <laughs> the guy yeah. who missed the cut was also three out of five. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, Mark, can you give us, I know that I, I still have students who come to my golf schools who do not fully comprehend strokes gained. And I love being able to explain the complex simply and I thought, who better to explain strokes gain simply than the person who came up with the idea? Can you explain it for people so they can just go, okay, I think I got an understanding of that. So everybody, I think, should have like the, the 10 second, the 30 second, the two minute explanations. Yes. Uh, seems like we have a little bit, of, uh, little bit of time here. So maybe I can give you multiple explanations and I hope one, one resonates. So... Uh, the problem, let's just start with putting because that's sort of easiest. And the problem with counting putts, putts per round, is that a one-footer, sinking a one-footer counts as much as sinking a 30-footer. They're both one putt. Yeah. Well, you don't want to give somebody the same credit mm -hmm. for both of those performances because, one, every golfer on the planet is going to sink 99.99% of their one-footers and you're not going to sink many of your 30-footers. So you want to give more credit to sinking a 30-footer than a 1-footer, and the question is, how much more credit? Well, you know sinking a 30-footer is a better performance because you don't see as many 30-footers 30, 30 go in the hole in, in one stroke. So the idea is to compare uh, how many putts did you take with a benchmark and for PGA Tour pros, the benchmark is the PGA Tour average number of putts from a given distance. Okay. So from 30 feet, the average number of putts to hole out for a PGA Tour pro is two. So if you take two putts from 30 feet, you're doing average. Yeah. If you three putt, you're losing a shot. 
And if you one putt, you're gaining a shot. So one footers, the average is one. So if you one putt from one foot, you're not gaining anything. Yeah, yeah. So whereas both count as one putt in a strokes gain perspective, the sinking the 30 footer gains a stroke, sinking the one footer gains you zero. And that makes sense. Yeah. The math becomes so much more complicated at eight feet because what happens at eight feet is PGA Tour pros will sink half their eight footers and miss half their eight footers. They'll one putt half the time and two putt half the time, and they almost never three putt from eight feet. So the PGA Tour average putts the hole out from eight feet is 1.5. Mm. So if a pro sinks an eight footer, one and a half versus the one is they gain a half a stroke. Yeah. And if they two putt from eight feet, they lose half a stroke. So you compare the number of putts, which would be two, compared to the average, one and a half, and you're one half of a stroke worse than average. So that's that's literally all it is. And if you make one eight footer and you lose one eight and you two putt um, you're the even. other eight footer, you're back to even because you yeah. gained a half and you lost a half and you're back to even. So that little explanation of, of strokes gain putting sort of encapsulates the, the main ideas, which is you want to measure how many strokes did you take compared to a relevant benchmark, which would be the PGA Tour average. And, and that's all it is. Um, does that make sense? It sure does. I love it. Thank you. How do you convert? Because a lot of golfers will go, well, that's the tour. What about me? I'm a 10 handicapper. Yeah. What about me? So for, for amateur golfers, you could compare to different benchmarks. What I tend to do for amateur golfers is I compare them to a scratch golfer benchmark because that's how handicaps are, are determined. So I will give putting, I will give uh, amateurs their strokes gained relative to a scratch golfer, and I'll also give them a putting handicap because okay. many, many golfers are more comfortable with handicaps, and it's pretty clear if somebody is a 15 handicap putter versus an eight handicap putter, well, the eight handicap putter is better. Yeah. Uh, and so that converts it into a language that most amateurs are familiar with. So we give handicaps for approach shots and handicaps for bunker shots and handicaps for putting and handicaps for, for driving. But it's all underneath that is the strokes, there are the strokes gain calculations. I love that because you know, one of my favorite words in life, and certainly this COVID-19 experience that uh, we're all dealing with at the moment, is helping us gain perspective. And I love the word perspective. It says patience, it says wisdom, it says knowledge to me. And I think as any coach, as any golfer, it's so important for us just, just knowing that, that, that eight foot range and that 30 foot range on the green and go, well, if I make half of my eight footers, I'm really pretty good. As a five handicapper, I'm putting as well as the average putter on the PGA Tour. And I think it gives golfers in particular a better perspective, whether they're faced with that 200 yard carry over a hazard to a green, that they're, because they're a man, they're going for it. Yep. Or whether they're getting mad at themselves for missing an eight footer. And I think it just gives us perspective. And it, it's, it's a tremendous tool, I think, that the best coaches in the world are fully taking advantage of. And the better players are really starting to use. And I'm telling you, if you're a golfer out there listening in and watching in, this is information that might seem like, well, this is only for tour players. No, it's not. It's for you. It's something that I believe every golfer, and I strongly believe this, that every golfer, once they gain that perspective that, better statistics and better decision making brings to the table, they're going to be able to play better golf. Exactly. And going back to, you know, Ricky Fowler sinking 49 out of 50 putts from inside 10 feet, that can lead to people with an incorrect perspective, which is, okay, I'm going to practice my 10 footers until I can make 80% of these. Yeah. And that's completely unrealistic because the best putters in the world only make 50% from eight feet, there's no way you'd be wasting your time with this unrealistic goal that you'd just be frustrated. And you, and you do need some, some perspective, as you say. So uh, 
this is one one interesting uh, thing I found in in digging through the uh, the putting data. How many putts over 21 feet uh, does a PGA Tour pro sink in four rounds? In a four round event where they make the cut, what is the average number of putts that they sink outside of 21 feet? Uh, any any ideas? I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, I'll just I love tell it. You. I love it. I, I, I'm going to have a guess, and I'm going to go three. Three. Excellent. And that is a fantastic guess. I will tell you that most of the guesses that I hear are in the four to seven range. Yes. So three is actually much better. And the answer is one and a half. Wow. That's amazing. See, perspective. And so, exactly. It's like, if you think you're going to make many, that's for four rounds. Yeah, <laughs> you got 72 holes. Not that you're going to be outside 21 feet every time. But right. you will a lot. That's right. And so PGA Tour pros make 15% of their putts from 20 feet. That's a small number. The goal from outside of 20 feet, two putting is a good goal from outside of 20 feet. Yes, you don't want a three putt, but you shouldn't be beating yourself up if you don't sink that 20, 25, 30 footer that just, you know, hits the lip or whatever. Th those are good putts. Two putting from outside of 20 feet is is a really good goal, and it happens to go in. That's a bonus. Yeah. That's an absolute, absolute bonus. Yeah. Um, 90 golfers, by the way, make 6% of their putts from 20 feet. So that's, yeah, it's a fairly substantial difference. But what matters more in differentiating pros from amateurs are the short putts three to 10 feet. And there's, there's two reasons for that. Number one is there's significant skill differences uh, between pros and amateurs, and even among pros on four and five foot putts. The best PGA Tour pros sink 5% more five footers than average PGA Tour pros. And of course the skill differences are bigger compared to amateurs, but of all the distance ranges, three to 10 feet is more important than outside of, of 10 feet. And that doesn't mean in terms of perspective, you shouldn't practice these other putts. I'm not mm. saying that at all. You yeah. should practice everything, but it's important to practice three, four and five footers and not just say, oh, those are good. I don't need to practice those. Let's practice my lag putting. Yeah. You can't gain too much from solely, you know, putting too much time in lag putting. You can gain a lot from sinking more putts in the three to 10, 10 foot range. So I'd say uh, focusing on increasing your one putts, you get a bigger bang for the buck, a bigger return than, than trying to minimize your, your three putts. And how do you minimize, how do you, how do you do both of those things? Minimize three putts and uh, maximize one putts, get better in three to 10 feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Write that down, everybody. If you're listening, write that down. That, that's great information. And Doc, I've got to say this because I ask, if I've got a group of six students that have come to a three-day golf school with me, I love to start out, we always start out with a little chat session at the beginning, and I say, can everybody, we've got, we've got four shots, driving, approach shots, around the green, potting, okay? Which is number one? I need number one and number two from everybody. And nobody, nobody gets it right as far as just general satellite view importance. And I get it. If you, you're a good hitter and you struggle to make short putts, you're going to list putting. But I really do ask them for everybody, can you give us that, that importance? And people really don't get, it, don't get it right often enough. And I think that's yeah. it's causing them to miss out on, on, on some gold, really. What? What's your take on that? I, I know you've looked at that, and, and, and what's, the, what's the order of importance, generally speaking? So generally speaking, if, and I think that's a good way to, to phrase it, because golfers should work on their individual strengths and weaknesses, but for uh, the general message is it's clearly approach shots are number one in terms of differentiating better players from, from worse players, approach shots. And by that, I mean all shots starting outside 100 yards from the hole, excluding tee shots on par fours and fives. Okay. Um, so approach shots are the biggest differentiator between 
uh, golfers that shoot 90 and golfers that shoot 80. And so out of that 10 stroke difference, about four strokes comes from hitting better approach shots. So four out of 10 is from, uh, four out of those 10 shots are from better approach shots. That's and um, um, among PGA Tour pros, one of the fascinating things was it's very similar. If you take a look at an average PGA Tour pro versus a top 10 PGA Tour pro, about 40% of that difference is due to better approach shots. And mm. that's surprising to, to many people, but I would say there's, there's two reasons for that. One is there's a lot of approach shots, so the number of shots matter. And the second is skill differences matter. And there are tremendous skill differences uh, on, on approach shots. So just, just to give you uh, one, of my, one of my favorite stats here, um, goes to perspective, it goes to the importance of, of approach shots. Uh, a PGA Tour pro from 150 yards in the fairway will have a median proximity. By that I mean half the shots are inside this range and half the shots are outside this range. How many feet? So how many feet would a PGA Tour pro from 150 yards in the fairway, where would they knock it so that what distance would half be inside and half be outside? And again, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm happy I'll to just it. I love the challenge. I don't mind being wrong. I'm wrong often. Um, I would say it is 27 feet. Excellent guess. Excellent guess. So... From 150 yards, it's actually 23 feet, but that's, that's sort of in, in the right ballpark. And most people will think that, oh, it's like 15 feet or 10 yeah. feet, whatever. Yeah. They're sort of way, way, way off. So, you know, 23 feet is an average tour pro. Let's go to an average weekend golfer who shoots 90. 150 yards in the fairway, and this I don't, don't expect you to know, <laughs> But uh, you want to take a guess or you want me to tell I, you? I'll, I'll have a guess. It's 42 feet. Wow. Uh, that's correct for 80 golfers. A 90 golfer is 56 feet. Wow. Almost 20 yards 20. <laughs> is sort of their, their shot pattern size or their margin for error, their, their uncertainty in, in that shot. So pros, remember, 23 feet, 90 golfers, 56 feet more than double the distance. Yeah, yeah. And so there are huge skill differences and there's a lot of strokes to be gained by just tightening up that, mm -hmm. that shot pattern in all sorts of ways that you give tips mm -hmm. all the time about how to improve your ball striking. And, Aim at uh, the middle of the green. Let's start with that. There you go. Aim at Absolutely. the middle of the green. Absolutely. So, so one of the things that, that amateurs can do when they get out to, to the course or they get out to, to the range is how do you measure this for yourself? You know, yeah. I'm giving you averages for, uh, that I have in, in, in my data, but you can go out and you can hit shots or you can track shots during your round when you're, you say, between 145 and 150 yards in the fairway and you see how close you get it to the target. And maybe your target, as you suggested, is the middle of the green. And you can pace it off and say, okay, I was 10 feet away from the target, I was 60 feet away. And you just list those numbers and you cut it in half. And whatever that number is in the middle is your median proximity. Mm -hmm. And you should see what it, what it is and track that and see if you're getting better. So if you're working on these kind sure. of shots, you would hope that over the course of a season, if, if, you, if you take lessons and you practice, if you get that 56 feet down to 42 feet, you've now basically changed your approach game from that of a 90 golfer to an 80 golfer. Yeah, yeah, um, that, that is huge. And Mark, I've got to say this, you know, and, and I know you wrote the book quite a long time ago, but I've, I've said this, a number of people, it's kind of a cool question to ask coaches, hey, what's your favorite golf book? And everyone's expecting Hogan's, you know, five and Jack Nicholas, my way. I go, yeah, it's Dr. Mark Brody, every shot counts. Because to <laughs> me, there's no opinion in that book. There's no, I think, I feel it should be done this way. It is pure fact and it's pure gold in my estimation. And I think every coach, that is a must read. And every golfer, 
if you want to get better, you really, really should take the time to go and read it. Now is a tremendous opportunity. You're going to enhance your ability to make good decisions. And I think if, if I'm a 90 goal for listening to this, I'm going, whoa, I, I average 56 feet from 150 yards. That's a good drive in the fairway. I don't do that <laughs> that often. So I'm just, you know, from, from 60, from 50 yards out, I'm going to aim at the middle of the green every single time. That's the name of the game, really. Uh, and golf is neat. We need to, particularly us guys, we have a lot of ego. And we, <laughs> I got the shot. I, of course, yeah, I hit the shot like last year. You know, I, I pulled it off. No, let's go at the middle of the green. Absolutely. And so this has implications for measuring your progress to achieve your goal of, of shooting lower scores, but it also has implications for strategy. So exactly as you said, if you've got... If you've got a shot pattern that's like this, you can fire at the flag. Yeah. Got a shot pattern like this, middle middle of the green. And when is your shot pattern like that? When you're closer to the hole. Yes. When you're 20 yards off the green instead of 150 yards away. Yes, yes. And that's why how far we hit the ball has really become so important because the closer you are to the green, the hole the easier yep. the game becomes. I, I'm, I'm yet to have someone come to one of my golf schools who is better with the six iron than they are with the nine iron. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, and maybe one, one, uh, one comment on that about how knowing these, uh, the, these facts, I guess, can impact your, your strategy. And one of the uh, strategic implications of this, which – has been around for a long time, lay up to your favorite distance. Yes. Versus try and get as close to the green as you can while avoiding hazards and penalties and, and other, other difficulties that could, uh, could be closer to the green and could be because you're hitting a, hitting a longer shot. And so from the fairway, from 80 yards, and I'm looking at a, a weekend golfer, a 90 golfer, okay. their average strokes to hole out from 80 yards in the fairway is 3.4. So almost half the time they're making, they're making bogey, if that's their approach. Exactly. Yeah. From the rough, from 30 yards, their average is 3.1. Hmm. So they are far better from the rough, from 50 yards closer, yeah. than they are from the fairway. So that 50-yard difference, even if you compare, you know, you make the 30-yard tougher from the rough and the 80-yard the a little bit easier from, from the fairway, there's a huge difference. And closer to the hole is, is better in terms of, uh, in terms of having a, a lower average score. So that's so that, that's so interesting, Mark. That's so interesting. A, a couple of uh, a couple of years ago now, it seems like that maybe it was uh, no, it was PGA show two years ago. I yep. did a presentation about a particular golfer that was with us on one of our trips, and we were playing at Valderrama, and he had this 200-yard shot for his second shot into the 17th green at Valderrama, and you ran the numbers for me. Uh, Randy is a good friend of mine, and I'll have to tell him that we, I, I spoke about him again. He's always like, no, you've got to stop telling that story. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he, Randy's about a 15 handicapper, and he had 200-odd yards over a hazard to the green, and you ran the numbers. Can you tell us what you came up with for that, please? Yeah, it was, it was sort of fun because you told the story in the presentation before me. And of course, I didn't like change my presentation. I had that sort of ready to go. We hadn't talked and it just yeah. meshed so, so nicely. And it was pretty much this, this Randy example, which is when you do all the analysis, you need to be 90% sure that you can carry that water in order for it to make sense versus, versus laying up. So... That's that's a pretty that's pretty a tall number. order. Nine nine out of ten. Nine out of ten is like you got to be really really good at that shot. Mm. And I I suspect that most amateurs aren't anywhere close to that. It's another thing you can go out and try yourself. From you know I have a hazard in front of the green. You get some some balls you don't mind losing, and I'm two hundred yards out. How many of them will clear the the water? And if it is ninety percent or more, then then go for it. But if it's 30, 40, 60%, there's, there's absolutely no way that you should uh, 
risk that if your goal is to minimize your score. If you want to shoot lower scores, <laughs> so maybe you don't. Maybe you don't care about hitting it in the water, and that's fine. You want to pull off the hero shot, and that's where you get there. But if your goal really is to shoot lower scores, then you want to play smart golf. You want to play strategic golf, and you want to take the risks where – uh, it's beneficial, and you want to be more conservative where the play calls for it. You want to play the numbers. Uh, Mark, here's a question that I've thought about often, uh, oftentimes since we've had that discussion. Let's say a player's got 140 yards to the green, and they don't hit the ball very far, but there's a hazard in front of the green. Would the numbers still be the same? Would it still be 90% no matter how far no. you've got? No, absolutely not. And um, my my son came up with a with a good example, Christopher, who you've met at, uh, at at Ping. And so, one thought experiment is to think of the extremes. And so, this is what he came up with: if you have uh, water that covers, say, fifty yards in front of the green, mm -hmm. and so you're at one hundred and forty, you said, uh, and you're thinking about laying up. So an extreme would be, suppose you're at 55 yards. Yeah. Would you lay up to 50 yards <laughs> to then hit the next shot? And the answer is absolutely not. Of course, you're not gaining much by going from 55 yards to 50 yards. Yeah. So in order to hit, uh, you say, what is the break-even point from 55 yards? And the answer is like close to zero. As long as you have almost any chance <laughs> – yeah. of clearing that water, you got to go for it. So okay. the further you are, the higher that hurdle of 90%. As you get closer to the hazard, that hurdle goes down okay. until it until it hits zero. So for a, a typical golfer from 140 yards, the, the hurdle might be 50-50. And the reason is you got to clear that water sometime. <laughs> At some point, yeah. You gotta At some point, you, you got you to clear it. So... Um, if you're going to put it in, you know, from 200 yards, if you're going to put it in the water, um, if you can't clear it nine out of 10 times, you should lay up. But from 150 or 120 yards, gotcha. there you got to go for it. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. And, you know, one of the questions I've seen scrolling through here, Mark, mm -hmm. is how can people, how can amateurs get access to this information or, or, or what you call the amateur benchmarks? How can people get that? Do you have some tool or some technology yep. that people can gain access to where they can see that and use that? Yeah. So there is a number of number of uh, apps that are, that are out there. We developed ours um, in part because we didn't want people to reinvent the wheel to create some, all their own new spreadsheets and whatever to do the exact same things. And then it's still hard to go back and figure uh, what happened last month and to average all these different things together. So we created an app called Golf Metrics. It's on uh, Android and, and iOS for, for Apple, uh, Apple users, the, ma the majority. So Golf Metrics. And it's not GPS-based, which means um, it doesn't have fancy graphics, uh, satellite images of, of the holes. But it also has the advantage of it works with every course, no matter how you change the, the tees. And it's very quick. We designed it to make the data entry as fast, as simple as possible. That's huge. That's and huge. so the, the way it works, I mean, uh, many college teams use this and many uh, mini tour players, players use this. And, of course, many, many amateurs use it, use it as well. And you could – at the end of the round, enter your data. But what I prefer to do is when you walk off the first screen and you're walking to the second tee, take 10 or 15 seconds to enter your three, four, five, six shots. That's all it takes, 10 seconds maybe. You're not slowing down the game. You could be waiting for other people to hit off, off the yeah. second tee when you enter it. And so by the time you walk off the 18th green, you have one more hole to enter, and that takes you another 10 seconds. And then you get a report huh. and you get a report strokes gain with handicaps on how well did you hit different shots. You can compare that to last round or the round before you can compare this month to, to the previous month, but you basically get a read on, on how well your game is doing. And it really helps build that perspective as well, because you can see shot by shot, what is your strokes gained? And so 
many people just don't realize when they are, say, uh, 65 yards out in the rough and they're trying to get close to that tuck pin and they dump it in the bunker, which is easy to do. Yes. How many strokes you lose doing that? It's an eye opener that, geez, hit the green from 65 yards. The number one rule is to try and hit the green. The green. And if you, you put too many of those shots in the sand, well, you, you get this thing right in your face saying you just lost, you know, nine tenths of a shot or whatever it is uh, on that one swing, which is, mm. which is horrible. Um, so this is a way for amateurs to get strokes gain results, to get, to get handicaps. And um, anyway, there, like I said, there are others, but uh, I highly recommend that or something because I'm a strong believer Amazing. in getting this unbiased feedback on how you're doing, what you need to work on, setting goals and seeing whether you're making progress. Golf metrics. Okay, I'll put a link to that uh, on the YouTube video. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, Mark, a couple of, I, I, almost a year or so ago now, I did a little bit of a, 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 a dig on some PGA Tour stats and I said, top 10 players driving, top 10 players irons, top 10 players short game, top 10 players putting. And it was truly eye-opening to me how the driving and irons lists were quite similar. There were a lot of double dips on those lists, but those were household names. And the short game and the putting, and everybody, everybody likes to think, you know, you putt for dough, and that's really how it goes. And, and that truly is not the case. There were so many names, even as a golf coach who likes to stay up on the game, even as a golf coach, so many names in the short game and putting side of the top 10 that I, I went, who is that? Who is that? <laughs> I couldn't pick that player out of a lineup, you know? Um, That's right. It, it really is mm -hmm. eye-opening to me. You got any comments on that? Well, that, that's sort of a, uh, a, great, a great example. And it's so hard to um, convince some people drive for show, putt for dough is, is not quite not quite right. And there is a nice quote from Greg Chalmers a few years ago. He was so He's, you you know Greg Chalmers. I yes. know I know you know him. But you know he was number one in putting, and like one twenty fifth in the FedEx Cup rank. And he goes, anybody who thinks that putting is the most important, just look at me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he's fighting to keep his card, but he was the best putter. That, that season on, on the PGA Tour. So there are many different ways to uh, s formulas for success, for yeah. sure. But if you want to take a look at what is a typical way to succeed on the tour, well, the best players excel at approach shots and driving. And you can take a look at many, many ways to dice and slice that. But the official world golf rankings, if you take a look at the top 10, that's a pretty good list of players, everybody on that list is really good at driving and really good at approach shots. And the only exception I would say that proves the rule currently is Webb Simpson is in the top 10 and he's an average driver of the ball. Mm. So he's a little bit on the short side. He makes up for the lack of distance with some accuracy, but every other person on that list is a great ball striker mm. and not necessarily a great putter. And so what happens is that these players who are great ball strikers tend to be at the top of the leaderboard week in and week out. And then it sort of becomes a putting contest among these players. Whoever putts the best that week often, often wins. So it's, it's a, a little bit of a generalization, but the winners on tour each week tend to be the best putters out of the group of the best ball strikers. Yeah. Not the other way around. Yeah. Um, so, but again, perspective is important. That doesn't mean short game and putting aren't important and you should no, ignore no. them. You need to work on everything. Yeah. Absolutely. All of those top 10 players are actually above average in short game and above average in putting. <laughs> yes. They just get most of their strokes from driving and approach shots and just not as many from superior wedge play and, 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 and putting. Mm. And, you know, from my side as a golf coach, golfers come to me and say, Andrew, can you fix my problem? Can you take care of my problem? And 
as a coach, I need to have a big toolbox of what's important, what matters. And I think it's so important for me, the coach, along with the player, to be able to determine and look at, okay, what really matters? Well, kind of full swing stuff. Tee to green kind of matters a lot. Let's look at that part of your game. If there are weak areas there, we need to build those up. But it's just so vital, I think, for all golfers and all coaches to be able to go not only in the swing, but just the whole set. I love that satellite view that I have in my mind of like, what's the big picture here? And I think that's really how you started. You wanted to get the big picture idea as to why your golf pro was so much better than you. And you wanted to almost right. look from up above and go, okay, I take the emotion out and I just look at these numbers. And I really do find it to be so integral to, towards improvement, towards improvement. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one of, one of my dreams would be players track their track their scores and when they come to Andrew Rice for a lesson or my pro Mike Diffley at Pelham Country Club for a lesson they show them the strokes gained reports yeah and then you have a conversation what do you want to work on and you decide what to work on and then a couple weeks later a month later they come back with the next report and you take a look and compare and say were you getting better in that area that we just worked on so it's not only setting a, a, a benchmark, where are you now, but seeing are you making progress to, to your goal? And uh, I think that's vital because if you just take a look at the score, well, you could shoot a bad score if you're working on your putting, say. You could shoot a bad score because you hit a bad drive, you hit something out of bounds, you put this 200-yard shot in the water, and your score goes up, but your putting could have gotten better, yeah. and that's what you were working on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really lets you uh, isolate different parts of the game. And, Doc, you know, I, I really believe in the value of statistics so much. I, I've aligned myself with Arcos, and I've played a few rounds using Arcos. I'm encouraging all my students to do so, but primarily because as their coach, I can go in and I can look at every round they've played and I can see, like you said, those handicap ratings for whether it be driving or short game or putting on each particular round. And it's amazing as a coach, the information I can pull from that. Um, exactly yeah. what you said your dream is. It's, it's getting there. It's, it really is getting there. And I think, I think once players everyday players i know the tour players are fully aware of this and they you, you've consulted with a number of them and they have various people that they consult with to help them work through the numbers and gain a better understanding as to where they're weak and where they need to get better uh, the everyday golfer really can have the same stuff available to them they can absolutely it it's strokes gained is not just for pga tour pros strokes gained is for all of us yeah yeah um uh, Mark, I'm going to, uh, you've put me on the spot a couple of times. I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. And if you cannot answer, that's okay. Talk to us about Jordan Spieth. I love Jordan Spieth. Uh, as you look at his numbers and, and, and look at the stats, what you got for us? I don't think I have any, any special uh, insight other than I love Jordan Spieth, uh, speak to his coach Cameron, Cameron McCormick on, on quite a few uh, occasions. And I always have the belief that somebody who's clearly that good with that much talent has shown he can win majors, he can win golf tournaments, he can hit great shots, he's a great putter, that, that he can get back. Um, so what exactly you know, has, has happened in, in the last couple of years, I can look at the numbers and you'll see, okay, he's not as good in each one of these mm. categories as, as he was, uh, as he was before, but I certainly uh, root for him and, and yeah. have a belief that, uh, that he'll find, he'll find it again. Um, so, I think so I really, good. Do. I really do believe he'll be back. Can you talk to us just a little bit about, yeah, I know when, when he was playing beautifully, he was out of this world in that 20 foot, 18, 15 foot range. Uh, how much better was he than the next player? I'm sure at some point you've looked at those numbers and gone, that's, that's yeah. eye opening. So I can so take you back to 20, 2015. 
when he had his formula for success has sort of changed. And it was, it was a bit of a mystery. Phone call. Okay, thank if you. you uh, if you if you take a look at the numbers, he was a little bit of a mystery because he was not number one in any category, but he was top 10 in every category. Yeah. So when he gained about 2.4, 2.5 shots per round in each of the categories, he would gain like points with uh, his short game and 0.6 with his approach shots and 0.6 with his driving. Okay. And so he was like top 10, top 15 in each one of the categories. And people pointed to him. It was like, how can he be so good? Because he doesn't, he doesn't drive it like Roy McIlroy. Uh, he wasn't putting it like Jason Day. He wasn't, he didn't have, and you could look at it and it was, and it was sort of a puzzle. And the, they said, well, it must be his heart. It must be his confidence or something. And I say, well, that could lead to the shots. That could explain sure. some of the shots, but I'm just looking at the shots, and what I see is this balanced approach, this balanced formula for success, and that's a perfect example of any any way that you can do it that can add up to gaining, you know, two, two and a half strokes will make you the number one player in the world, and there's different ways to do that. Luke Donald was an example of somebody that had, you know, zero gain from his driving, but he still gained two and a half shots from all the other categories combined. And there's different, different ways you could do it. There's different formulas for success. And um, I think there's a lot of good stories there that the stats sort of reveal. Yeah, I, I, it reminds me of a great Jeff Ogilvy story. I loved listening to Jeff Ogilvy. And uh, he told the story of whenever Tiger was in his prime, he would hit balls on the range next to Tiger and just be amazed at the power and the grace. And he'd walk off the tee feeling like he could never beat Tiger and he never would. And then he would hit balls on the range next to Jordan and go, well, his ball kind of flies like mine and it goes about the same distance. And I think I can beat him this week. And he said, I never would. And it, it just, it was a bit of a head scratcher, but I think what, what you've just explained kind of makes sense how he wasn't amazing at anything, but he was, really good at everything and that's uh, that's how he got it done yep um there's there there's so many uh so many fascinating uh things we could we could talk about is there any uh anything in particular you want to jump to next no, put me on I, the spot I, I, would or... love, I would love we've got like two minutes uh, i would love to to chat to you just for two minutes regarding short game uh, I've, sure. I've learned from Arcos that most short game shots are played out of the rough. Yes. And I see in my golf school and, and partially myself to blame, people practicing out the fairway all the time. I, yep. I, I get it. It's typically a more challenging strike when the ball's on a yep. tight lie. But out of the rough, I think we need to practice more. What do you see from players yep. out of the rough short game or, or just short game wise? Yeah, so I, I wrote a golf magazine article on this quite quite some time ago, and I looked at five short game categories, which was basically inside of 60 yards, but I broke it 0 to 20 and 20 to 60. I looked at fairway rough, and then I put the greenside sand shots in another category, and I said, where do amateur golfers lose the most strokes, or where do they have the most potential to, to gain strokes? And the answer is number one. 20 to 60 yards in the rough is wow. where amateurs have the biggest potential for, for gaining strokes. Uh, number two would be all of the greenside sand shots. Number three would be rough from zero to 20 yards. Hmm. The number four would be 20 to 60 yards in the fairway. And number five would be zero to 20 yards in the fairway. So exactly what you were saying, amateurs should practice more from the rough because they have more shots, when they miss the green, they're more likely to miss it in the rough. So rough first, greenside sand second, and then these fairway chip shots would be sort of at the, at the bottom of the list in terms of where can you gain strokes. Well, I've got to say, just if people listen again, if they just got that little nugget right there, that really is, is so, so helpful. That is gold. 
Uh, Mark, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I, I do. I know you live close to the city, and I know that's not uh, not a great place to be. So I'm sure you've been on lockdown for a long time. Um, know that we're thinking about you. We're thinking about the city. We're thinking about you and your family. Um, and we're going to come out of this. We're going to be good. Yeah, absolutely. And and we're all doing well here. Thanks. Thanks for the thoughts. And uh, my my thoughts go out to you, your family, and 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 all the listeners. You know to stay safe, stay healthy for yourself, your family, and, and your friends. And Mark, thank you so much for all you do for us golf coaches. It's, it really is a tremendous amount. And you sharing your awesome information and just your love for golf is sincerely appreciated from this side. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Eh? And, and thanks, thanks to, uh, thank you for that. And thanks, Andrew, because you know, I'm I'm a an educator in a different way that that you're a you're a golf coach, but True. the ability to synthesize information and then present it uh, to your players and and to the world through all of your uh, your videos and other other outlets is is really fantastic. And I'm I'm always impressed by by how you can convey these ideas in a clear and simple way. And that that's what a great educator attempts to do. Hey, I love to hear that. Thank you so much. I appreciate all right, it. thanks a lot, Andrew. Safe, Thanks. You too. Take, Take care. Take care.